Chapter 4 Education Under Outside Control In the new program of educating the Negro, what would become of the white teachers of the race? This is a simple question requiring only a brief answer. The remaining few Christian workers who went south not so long after the Civil War and established schools and churches to lay the foundation on which we should now be building more wisely than we do, we would honor as a martyred throng. Anathema be upon him who would utter a word derogatory to the record of these heroes and heroines. We would pay high tribute also to unselfish southerners like Haygood, Curry, Ruffner, Northern, and Vance, and to white men of our time, who believe that the only way to elevate people is to help them to help themselves. The unfortunate successors of the Northern missionary teachers of Negroes have thoroughly demonstrated that they have no useful function in the life of the Negro. They have not the spirit of their predecessors and do not measure up to the requirements of educators desired in accredited colleges. If Negro institutions are to be as efficient as those for the whites in the South, the same high standard for the educators to direct them should be maintained. Negro schools cannot go forward with such a load of inefficiency and, especially when the white presidents of these institutions are often less scholarly than Negroes who have to serve under them. By law and custom, the white presidents and teachers of Negro schools are prevented from participating freely in the life of the Negro. They occupy a most uncomfortable dual position. When the author once taught in a school with a mixed faculty, the white woman connected with the institution would bow to him in patronizing fashion when on the campus, but elsewhere they did not see him. A white president of one Negro school never entertains a Negro in his home, preferring to shift such guests to the student's dining room. Another white president of a Negro college maintains on the campus a guest cottage which Negroes can enter only as servants. Still, another such functionary does not allow students to enter his home through the front door. Negroes trained under such conditions without protest become downright cowards and in life will continue as slaves in spite of their nominal emancipation. What different method of approach or what sort of appeal would one make to the Negro child that cannot be made just as well by a white teacher? Someone asked not long ago. To be frank, we must concede that there is no particular body of facts that Negro teachers can impart to children of their own race that may not be just as easily presented by persons of another race if they have the same attitude as Negro teachers. But in most cases, tradition, race hate, segregation, and terrorism make such a thing impossible. The only thing to do in this case is to deal with the situation as it is. Yet we should not take the position that a qualified white person should not teach in a Negro school. For certain work which temporarily some whites may be able to do better than the Negroes, there can be no objection to such service. But if the Negro is to be forced to live in the ghetto, he can more easily develop out of it under his own leadership than under that which is superimposed. The Negro will never be able to show all of his originality as long as his efforts are directed from without by those who socially proscribe him. Such friends will unconsciously keep him in the ghetto. Herein, the emphasis is not upon the necessity for separate systems, but upon the need for common sense schools and teachers who understand and continue in sympathy with those whom they instruct. Those who take the position to the contrary have the idea that education is merely a process of imparting information. One who can give out these things or devise an easy plan for so doing is an educator. In a sense, this is true, but it accounts for most of the troubles of the Negro. Real education means to inspire people to live more abundantly, to learn to begin with life as they find it, and make it better. But the instruction so far given Negroes in colleges and universities has worked to the contrary. In most cases, such graduates have merely increased the number of malcontents who offer no program for changing the undesirable conditions about which they complain. One should rely upon protest only when it is supported by a constructive program. Unfortunately, Negroes who think as the author does and dare express themselves are branded as opponents of interracial cooperation. As a matter of fact, however, 
Such Negroes are the real workers in carrying out a program of interracial effort. Cooperation implies equality of the participants in the particular task at hand. On the contrary, the usual way now is for the whites to work out their plans behind closed doors, have them improved by a few Negroes serving nominally on a board, and then employ a white or mixed staff to carry out their program. This is not interracial cooperation. It is merely the ancient idea of calling upon the inferior to carry out the orders of the superior. To express it in post-classic language, as did Jesse O. Thomas, the Negroes do the coing and the whites the operating. This unsound attitude of the friends of the Negro is due to the persistence of the medieval idea of controlling underprivileged classes. Behind closed doors, these friends say you need to be careful in advancing Negroes to commanding positions unless it can be determined beforehand that they will do what they are told to do. You can never tell when some Negroes will break out and embarrass their friends. After being advanced to positions of influence, some of them have been known to run amok and advocate social equality or demand for their race, the privileges of democracy when they should restrict themselves to education and religious development. It is often said that the time is not right for Negroes to take over the administration of their institutions, for they do not have the contacts for raising money. But what becomes of this argument when we remember what Booker T. Washington did for Tuskegee and observe what R. R. Moton and John Hope are doing today? As the first Negro president of Howard University, Mordecai Johnson has raised more money for that institution among philanthropists than all of its former presidents combined. Furthermore, if after three generations the Negro colleges have not produced men qualified to administer their affairs, such an admission is an eloquent argument that they have failed ingloriously and should be immediately closed. Recently, someone asked me how I connect my criticism of the higher education of the Negroes with new developments in this sphere, and especially with the four universities in the South, which are to be made possible by the millions obtained from governments, boards, and philanthropists. I believe that the establishment of these four centers of learning at Washington, Atlanta, Nashville, and New Orleans can be so carried out as to mark an epoch in the development of the Negro race. On the other hand, there is just as much possibility for a colossal failure of this whole scheme. If these institutions are to be the replica of universities like Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Chicago, if the men who are to administer them and teach in them are to be the products of roll-top desk theorists who have never touched the life of the Negro, the money thus invested will be just as profitably spent if it is used to buy peanuts to throw at the animals in a circus. Some of the thought behind the new educational movement is to provide in the South for educating the Negroes who are now crowding northern universities, especially the medical schools, many of which will not admit Negroes because of the racial friction in hospital practice. In the rush merely to make special provisions for these undesirable students, the institutions which are to train them may be established on false ideas and make the same blunders of smaller institutions which have preceded them. It will hardly help a poisoned patient to give him a large dose of poison. In higher institutions for Negroes, organized along lines required for people with differently circumstanced, some few may profit by being further grounded in the fundamentals. Others may become more adept in the exploitation of their people, and a smaller number may cross the divide and join the whites in useful service but the large majority of the products of such institutions will increase rather than diminish the load which the masses have had to carry ever since their emancipation. Such ill-prepared workers will have no foundation upon which to build. The education of any people should begin with the people themselves, but Negroes thus trained have been dreaming about the ancients of Europe and about those who have tried to imitate them. In a course at Harvard, Students were required to find out whether Pericles was justly charged with trying to supplant the worship of Jupiter with that of Juno. Since that time, Negroes thus engaged have learned that they would have been much better prepared for work among the Negroes in the Black Belt if they had spent that time learning why John Jasper, 
of Sun Du Move fame joined with Joshua in contending that the planet stood still in the middle of the line while he fought the battle the second time. Talking the other day with one of the men now, giving the millions to build the four Negro universities in the South, I find that he is of the opinion that accredited institutions can be established in mushroom fashion with theorists out of touch with the people. You can go almost anywhere and build a three million dollar plant, place in charge a white man to do what you want accomplished, and in a short while he can secure or have trained to order the men necessary to make the university. We want here a man who has his master's degree in English, he will say. Send me another who has his doctor's degree in sociology, and I can use one more in physics. Now, experience has shown that men of this type may fill in, but a university cannot be established with such raw recruits. The author once had some experience in trying to man a college in this fashion, and the result was a story that would make an interesting headline for the newspapers. When Dr. William Bainey Harper was establishing the University of Chicago, he called to the headship of the various departments only men who had distinguished themselves in the creative world. Some had advanced degrees, and some had not. Several of them had never done any formal graduate work at all. All of them were men whose thought was moving the world. It may be argued that the Negroes have no such men and must have them trained, but such a thing cannot be forced as we are now doing it. It would be much better to stimulate the development of the more progressive teachers of old than experiment with novices produced by the de degradation of higher education. The degradation of the doctorate especially dawned upon the author the other day more clearly than ever when a friend of his rushed into his office saying, I have been trying to see you for several days. I have just failed to get a job for which I had been working, and I am told that I cannot expect a promotion until I get my doctor's degree. This is what he called it. He cannot even pronounce the words, but he is determined to have his doctor's degree to get the job in sight. This shameful status of higher education is due in a large measure to low standards of institutions with a tendency toward the diploma mill procedure. To get a job or to hold one, you go in and stay until they grind you out a doctor's degree. You do not have to worry any further. The assumption is that almost any school will be glad to have you thereafter, and you will receive a large salary. Investigation has shown that men who have the doctorate not only lose touch with the common people, but they do not do as much creative work as those of less formal education. After having this honor conferred upon them, these so-called scholars often rest on their oars. Few persons have thought of the seriousness of such inertia among men who are put in the lead of things because of meeting statutory requirements of frontier universities which are not on the frontier. The General Education Board and the Julius Rosenwald Fund have a policy which may be a partial solution of the underdeveloped Negro college instructors problem. These foundations are giving Negro teachers scholarships to improve themselves for work in the sphere in which they are now laboring in the South. These boards, as a rule, do not send one to school to work for the doctor's degree. If they find a man of experience and good judgment, showing possibilities for growth, they will provide for him to study a year or more to refresh his mind with whatever there is new in his field. Experience has shown that teachers thus helped have later done much better work than doctors of philosophy made to order. The northern universities cannot do graduate work for Negroes along certain lines when they are concentrating on the educational needs of people otherwise circumstance. The graduate school for Negroes studying chemistry is with George W. Carver at Tuskegee. At least a hundred youths should wait daily upon the words of the scientist to be able to pass on to the generations unborn his great knowledge of agricultural chemistry. Negroes desiring to specialize in agriculture should do it with workers like T. M. Campbell and B. F. Hubert among the Negro farmers of the South. In education itself, the situation is the same. Neither Columbia nor Chicago can give an advanced course in Negro rural education, for their work in education is based primarily upon what they know of the educational needs of the whites. 
Such work for Negroes must be done under the direction of the trailblazers who are building schoolhouses and reconstructing the educational program of those in the backwoods. Leaders of this type can supply the foundation upon which a university of realistic education may be established. We offer no argument here against earning advanced degrees, but these should come as honors conferred for training crowned with scholastic distinction, not to enable a man to increase his salary or find a better paying position. The schools which are now directing attention exclusively to these external marks of learning will not contribute much to the uplift of the Negro. In Cleveland, not long ago, the author found at the Western Reserve University something unusually encouraging. A native of Mississippi, a white man trained in a northern university and now serving as a professor in one, has under him, in sociology, a Negro student from Georgia. For his dissertation, this Negro is collecting the sayings of his people in everyday life. Their morning greetings, their remarks about the weather, their comments on things which happen around them, their reactions to things which strike them as unusual, and their efforts to interpret life as the panorama passes before them. This white Mississippian and black Georgian are on the right way to understand the Negro, and if they do not fall out about social equality, they will serve the Negro much better than those who are trying to find out whether Henry the Eighth lusted more after Anne Boylan than after Catherine of Aragon, or whether Elizabeth was justly styled as more untruthful than Philip II of Spain.